Corps acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Kickapoo, Peoria, Potawatomi, Miamia, and Ho-Chunk nations and peoples. Welcome to tonight's program, Let's Talk Truth or Consequences. I'm Jan Schwartz, the chair of this series and part of the steering committee of Spotlight, a program of NCJW Chicago North Shore. A year ago, due to the profound impact from the disinformation and misinformation that was being spread by artificial intelligence, we wanted to understand how social media operates to make this possible and why it is so influential. The scope of this as well as solutions could not be fully appreciated by one program. We invited our favorite partners, NCJW South Cook and Salon, another educational program of Chicago North Shore to join us in developing the series. In last week's program, Let's Talk My Truth, Your Truth, we explored how propaganda works using the lens of the Holocaust to understand how powerful it can be. Tonight, David Goldenberg, the Evelyn R. Green Midwest Regional Director of the Anti-Deflammation League, will help us recognize how artificial intelligence is able to choose the news and posts one receives on social media and spread that information on steroids, unbeknownst to the user. These mistruths may be on various topics, such as COVID and vaccinations, political issues, candidates and parties are pertaining to immigrants, race and religion. Tonight, we will learn how AI technically works and the role key phrases play in leading certain social media to its most receptive audiences. Next week in our final program of the series, Let's Talk My Rights, Your Rights, we will learn that First Amendment rights and regulation are not in conflict. We are honored to have David Goldenberg as our speaker tonight. Besides overseeing the ADL's activities in Northern Illinois, Indiana, Minnesota, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wisconsin, he was appointed by Illinois Governor J.B. Pritzker to serve on the Illinois Commission of Discrimination and Hate Crimes. He has played a significant role in launching programs to strengthen ties between Black, Latino, and Jewish communities in order to combat the spread of anti-Semitism, xenophobia, and religious discrimination. Before David takes it away, I want to remind you to feel free to put questions into the question tab instead of the chat during the presentation. Q&A will follow with a robust conversation. Please note tonight's presentation has closed captioning and is recorded. And now, David Goldenberg. Thanks so much, Jen. And thank you to all of you for being here today. I know it's probably been a, a long day, it's Thursday, I'm probably standing in between you and a nice glass of wine, or perhaps you're already having one. Um, and so I'm excited to share with all of you uh, this evening. It's, it, it is wonderful when I first spoke with Jan a number of months ago about this program. I think it's great that NCJW is taking the lead on this. And ADL and NCJW have had such a long and storied partnership and a rich partnership and it's a great honor to be with all of you and to be able to continue that partnership and that friendship and that cooperation and that collaboration in this way tonight. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and hopefully this will work. Um, Jan, can you give me a thumbs up if you can see it? Great. Okay. So let's spend some time uh, chatting and, and just for those who put questions into the Q&A, I just want you to know as I'm doing the presentation, I won't actually see it. So Jan will share them with me at the very end. Um, but let's talk a little bit about social media and the spread of misinformation. So, but first I wanna give you a 30 second kind of elevator pitch about ADL. So ADL was founded in 1913, actually right here in Chicago with the mission to stop the defamation of the Jewish people and to ensure just and fair treatment for all. When we look at the work we do and our mission and what we, shall we say, fight, we fight four big things. Number one, anti-Semitism. Number two, bigotry, bias, and discrimination. Number three, extremism. And number four, cyber hate. And when we look at how we fight it, we fight it through investigations and research. 
We fight it through education and trainings in K through 12 schools with law enforcement and workplace. And we all, and, and universities as well. And we do it through advocacy and assist from an advocacy perspective, from a policy perspective, and assisting, helping people and communities responding to incidents of anti-Semitism and other forms of hate. Centered to the part of, to my talk tonight, I want to highlight something that we launched back in 2017, ADL Center for Technology and Society. It was launched out in Silicon Valley in response to the spread of extremism and hate online and anti-Semitism online. And it was done in a way to work with tech companies to help them assess and improve their anti-hate policies, their user agreements, to hold companies accountable for hate and misinformation that occurs on their sites and their platforms, to ultimately decrease hate online and to advocate for users. And this also includes not just social media platforms now, but it's grown to different online gaming platforms and other forms of research. And as you can see by those gears turning on the right-hand side, it's that balance between work online and cyber and civil rights as well, which Jan talked about, which I think is gonna be the third session in this series. So tonight I wanna to do three big things. First, I wanna talk about social media. What does social media look like for adults and teens? How is it being used to spread hate and fear? Second, I wanna talk a little bit about algorithms and artificial intelligence. How do algorithms impact social media? What are the implications of algorithms and algorithmic bias? And then lastly, I wanna talk through some action steps, what we can do to address hate online and nurture digital civility in adults and in children. So let's start by talking and going through some data points and hopefully I won't bore you with them, but let's go through some data points about social media and society. So earlier this year, the Pew Research Center released an update of social media usage by adults. And as you can see on the chart on the left-hand side, which I'll make available uh, through Jam, you can see that Facebook is the, is the most widely used platform generally across the board. You can see an increase in users with YouTube, using YouTube and also Instagram and some newer platforms that are kind of making, you can see them on the incline a little bit on the bottom there. But in general, Facebook has historically always been uh, one of the most widely used online platforms among US adults. Second, this chart looks at age groups and the age gaps between people who use different online platforms. On the far left, you can see those ages 65 and above. The light green is ages 50 through 64. The blue is 30 through 49. And the black is 18 through 29. And so what you can see here is that those who use, and, and the numbers on the top are the percentages of, of people in that age bracket who use those online platforms. So you can see, for example, all the way on the right-hand side, 95% of people between the ages of 18 and 29 use YouTube. You can see roughly 65% use Snapchat. But as you look to the left, you can see you know, the, 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 the differential between uh, the percentage of young people versus older people. And you can see that the smallest age gap is down there at the bottom, which is only 20% of using Facebook. Again, Facebook ends up being among the most widely used platforms, regardless of age. Lastly here, we look at how often adults use these different platforms. You can see 70% of Facebook users visit the site and the platform on a daily basis. When you look at Snapchat, it's roughly 59%. And it goes down to Twitter where you can see roughly 46% visit it once a day. And this gives you a sense of how often these platforms are being used. And again, Facebook being among the most popular. So now I wanna go in this, the most recent study that Pew has done as it relates to social media usage with children under the age of 18 was done back in 2018. Here you can see that 45% of teens say they're online almost constantly, right? 45%, and when you merge that with several times a day, you're talking about 90%. And compare that to what it was back in 2014, 2015. Another data point that I wanna highlight here is that 75% of teens, the ages of 13 through 17, have at least one social media profile. 
So when you think about what kids and teens are being exposed to online, it's important to realize this. This here breaks down what they're using. You can see that YouTube is used by 85%. You can see that Snapchat, another video platform used by 69%. And you can see here that an Instagram, which includes videos, but it's both pictures and videos by 72%. And you can see it dropping down with Facebook at 51%. So when we think about those of us who are on social media and on this call right now, what we pay attention to might be very different than where our kids pay attention, what our kids and grandkids are watching and paying attention to on a social media perspective. Now, this big chart has got a ton of information and I'm gonna summarize it for everyone really quickly. That is, what do people have access to, at least teens? Um, and across, uh, on the left-hand side are desktops or a laptop computer. And you can see that that does vary among race, among um, uh, socioeconomic status, among parents' level of education. However, in the right-hand column, when you look at access to a smartphone, it's pretty universal regardless of gender, regardless of race, regardless of socioeconomic status, and regardless of parents' level of education. So when we think about access to technology and how kids are able to get onto these social media platforms, it's clear that a smartphone is the preferred way and a way that they're often using. Now, when we think about misinformation being shared online, which I'm gonna get into a, a lot more in the next couple of slides and, and beyond, when we think about who is sharing misinformation the most, it's actually studies have shown that it's actually not politics, but it is more about age then it is the biggest predictor of who shares fake news on Facebook, for example. And we found that uh, not just, uh, not, not we, but other different stu a studies showed that those who were over the age of 65 were seven times more likely to share misinformation on Facebook than those who are under the age of 65. When we look at it from a political perspective, a number of studies have shown that while those on the right, especially during the last election, were slightly more likely to share misinformation, the real misinformation that is shared is on the extremes on both the right and on the left when it comes to social media. So think about that, because I think there's a lot of misinformation about where does it come from. And it's important to realize that while there was a slight, as I said before, Slight, slightly higher with misinformation being shared by those on the right. Um, it is the extremes on the far right and on the far left that are both contributing to the spread of misinformation fairly consistently. Now, I wanted to share also, this was an interesting study that was put out earlier this year that looked at social media interactions by source credibility. So are you sharing information from the Washington Post or are you sharing misinformation from you know, Susie's blog that she's writing in the basement. And so this is a really interesting study here where you see, number one, the amount of information that is being forwarded and shared on social media more than doubled between 2019 and 2020. And when you look at it too, these data points, you see a 400% increase in sharing from unreliable news sources compared to just a 70% increase in sharing from reliable news sources. So think about then the dramatic increase of where misinformation is coming from. So let's spend a couple minutes now that I sort of set the stage here and talk a little bit about algorithms and how algorithms contribute to the spread of hate and misinformation. So let's first talk about what is an algorithm. An algorithm is, and I, and I don't like reading from a slide, but I'm going to read these ones because I think it's important. Number one, it's a sequence of step-by-step -step instructions that are designed to transform data into decisions. They're performed often by computers that allow decisions to be automated and greatly increase the speed and the scale of those decisions. And today, in many cases, algorithms replace human judgment in many professional, legal, and social contexts. And I'll say that that is a biased statement, but I also think it's a fact. Now, when we look at what else and also an algorithm is, is that social media platforms 
They use algorithms largely fueled by artificial intelligence and machine learning systems to deliver and moderate content, to determine what content should be recommended to a user and to serve advertisements to users. And you can see some of the logos on the right-hand side and those are all of those platforms use algorithms. And ultimately algorithms make these highly personal decisions by collecting and synthesizing vast amounts of user data and feed us into certain, certain places. Now, what's an algorithmic bias? So we've all done many, many searches and we've searched for red shoes and all of a sudden red shoes showed up in every single advertisement when we were on a line or on a platform. So let's talk about what algorithmic bias does. So algorithmic bias is implicit and or explicit bias that is programmed into the sequence of step-by-step -step instructions that are designed to transform data into decisions. They can create unfair outcomes for users, whether intentional or not. So this is about creating a pattern that ultimately feeds you into certain information or, or directs you more to more likely go uh, see certain types of information or receive certain types of information that ultimately could shape the way you think, the products you buy, the websites you go to, the information you ultimately receive. So let's kind of use a, a little example. And anybody who's used YouTube knows that this is, this is a, not a, an uncommon thing. So YouTube, if you've ever gone to it and you're signed in, has these recommended videos for you to watch. And if we were in a room, I would ask, I'd probably see a bunch of people nodding their heads and saying, oh yeah, I know what that is, right? Based on the videos that you have watched. So I did this search a little while ago, earlier today, and I decided, you know what? I want a new puppy and I want a beagle. So I went ahead and typed in to the search on YouTube, beagle puppy. Now, if you look at the results that come back as recommended videos, there's, you know, there's the French bulldog, there is the dash hound right there, but it doesn't entirely get exactly what I want. Now, I decided to wait for about 10 or 15 minutes, and I said, let's go do another search. And I typed in beagles. And all of a sudden, the second time I look for something, look what I see. They start feeding me more videos about beagle puppies. And you start seeing more and more dogs. And you, because all of a sudden, YouTube has taken my search term and now said, okay, they've looked for beagle puppies. They've looked for beagles. Now this person clearly likes dogs. And we're going to start feeding this person videos around dogs. We've all been there. If you search a TV show, or if you like to watch the Stephen Colbert opening, or you watch, like, like to watch Saturday Night Live, or you watch a video of a president speaking or something about ships. Inevitably, YouTube starts feeding and creating this algorithm. It's creating a profile about you and saying this person likes this information, th these types of videos or, or these types of topics. So it's gonna start feeding us information. So in this case, every time you search, you click on a video, you click on, on something, whether it be through Google or others, your search engine is creating and strengthening the algorithm. And ultimately, if you look at it in a circle, the filter bubble, as we like to call it. This idea, this notion that you then become, you are no longer exposed to these purple and pink and green and most of the blue dots, but instead you're just fed information around that circle. Now, it's wonderful in that you get the information that you theoretically want and that you're searching for. However, it begs the question of, if you're only receiving that information, what information are you not getting? What information do you not have access to? And when we think about kids, especially and others and how we get news and information, and you think about the algorithms that you get because of the websites that you go to, because of the types of news stories that you read, we find that it becomes exceptionally difficult and more and more difficult for you to be able to access information that you perhaps might not necessarily already be predisposed of, of uh, to, to uh, predisposed 
to or have a particular viewpoint. And so to receive and access viewpoints that are different than yours, you really have to work hard to break this algorithmic bubble. So what are the implications? And if, and if we were all together again, I would throw it out there and ask you to type certain things in. But when we think about the implications of using algorithms and creating algorithmic ampl amplification, what are those, are those implications? So I shared some of them, but let's kind of talk through a couple others. So earlier this year, ADL released a study on the YouTube algorithm. And we focused on extremist videos and we were highlighting how despite promises that YouTube had made, they were still housing extremist videos and people were able to access them in ways that were quite concerning. So we looked at nearly 2000 participants and approximately one in 10 viewed at least one video from an extremist channel on YouTube. And, a, and just and a little bit more than one in five views, viewed at least one video from an alternative channel. And what we found was that 37.6% of recommendations on videos after you viewed an alternative or an extremist channel started kicking back and taking you to channels that were quite the same. So with alternative channels, it was 37.6%. And but just slightly under that, were recommendations on videos from other extremist channels. And what we found was that nearly one in five followed a recommendation approximately 19 to 20% of the time. So when you broke it down here, you're talking about nearly one in three people who viewed just one video from an extremist channel were starting to see the additional videos popping up in their recommended video feed. And 20% of them we're going to one of those videos. It's deeply concerning when you think about what people have access to. And that most alarmingly, viewers of videos from extremist channels got, get almost as many recommendations for videos from alternative and extremist channels as they do for other types of content. So when we think about then sort of the rabbit hole that this algorithm on YouTube pushes people down, and when we think about the uh, um, the subjugation of individuals to this type of extremist information, and ultimately the indoctrin indoctrination of these individuals, well, certainly it starts with having access to these channels. And so when we looked at the algorithm, we found that YouTube's algorithm was reinforcing this. Now, there are other implications as well that we've seen when we think about the spread of misinformation. We've seen with COVID that 71% of YouTube's COVID misinformation was recommended by the algorithm. Think about that. When we look at the elections, we found that misinformation on Facebook, not, not we, other studies, show that Facebook got six times more clicks than factual news during the 2020 election. Think about that. From an anti-Semitism perspective, Facebook's algorithm and this is something that ADL has been at the forefront of, found to actively promote Holocaust denial. And we learn also that the TikTok algorithm promotes anti-Semitic death camp memes. So we think about the exposure that people have to anti-Semitism, to things like Holocaust denial as well, it has these implications across. Now I could put up additional headlines as it relates to uh, xenophobia and xenophobia around building the wall chants or around the spread of COVID that we saw uh, last year, ADL had done studies that showed the amount, the increase in um, anti-Asian sentiments and statements that were made on Twitter following President Trump's diagnosis of having COVID, for example. So we know that there are significant implications and how those implications then play out. Now, I can't draw the, the exact and direct co correlation between this misinformation and, on, and this type of online harassment, but I think it's important to still understand because inevitably there are pieces tied to this. So our Center for Technology and Society every year now for the third straight, actually for the third straight year conducted a survey of online hate and harassment. And we found among respondents this year was that 41% of respondents in, in, across America reported that they had been harassed in some form or fashion online. 27% of them had been subjected to severe harassment. And so while maybe you weren't one of them, 
think about it, one in four around your kitchen table has been a victim of se severe harassment online. And so when we think about people who are subjected to misinformation, to extremism, to other forms of hate, it begs the question then, what does that do to trigger this type of hate and harassment that people see? Within the Jewish community, you can see now here that more, almost one, more than one in one, more than one in every three were subjected to online harassment, and one in every five were subjected to severe harassment. So this is not insignificant and dramatic increases from previous years. And when we break it down by severe harassment broken by groups, you can see more than half of all respondents who identified as members of the LGBTQ plus community indicated that they had been victims of severe harassment. You can see the dramatic increases uh, and across the board for different people and different groups. And ultimately, where was this harassment occurring? This is a very colorful graph that I apologize, I didn't recreate to sort of match the brand of this presentation, but you can see that 75% of that harassment occurred on Facebook, um, or 75% of users of Facebook, excuse me, said that they are harassed. 24% said they were harassed on Twitter, 24% experienced it on Instagram, 21% on YouTube, and it goes down from there. But you can see some of these largest platforms are ultimately where this type of harassment is occurring. And it also coincides with where the most misinformation is occurring and where there's incredible culpability on the part of the platform and the company for not taking action against problems that they know exist. So let's talk about action steps. First, always do this. And we have these three steps. Number one, always speak out. Speak out against all forms of hate and misinformation. Number two, share facts. When you see misinformation, respond to it. Don't just let it sit there because when we let it sit there, it becomes fact. We know when we see misinformation and so use those facts to respond. And then lastly, and I really frankly can't think of any group more than NCJW, which shows strength by being there for allies and being a strong ally when another community or another individual who isn't Jewish, who isn't a woman, is a victim of hate and harassment. And so kola kavod along those lines, but it's really important to understand that. So ADL has also outlined something that we call our repair plan, which is an acronym for I'll walk you through the different steps on how we think it is a whole of society approach toward responding this to this type of online hate and harassment. So first, regulation and reform. It's government has to do its part and we believe that there can be increased regulation that does not violate people's first right or first amendment rights and that platforms can be transparent and must be transparent about the functions and the impact of their algorithms and engagement features. They have to agree to independent verification. They have to be open to us coming in. They have to adopt a civil rights lens and they have to involve communities that are targeted by hate mongers and extremists ultimately in coming up with these types of solutions. The second thing is we have to see enforcement at scale. Government has to protect consumers by holding social media platforms accountable for adopting and ultimately enforcing equitable, equitable policies and that are designed to identify and combat hate and harassment across sites and platforms. You can see just for example, ADL's annual report card on Holocaust denial, and you can see the problems that are occurring on some of the most popular social media platforms. And so we've got to be able to address this ultimately at scale. Third, we need companies to choose people over profit. Last summer, ADL, working with the NAACP, Color of Change, LULAC, UNIDOS, and a host of civil rights organizations launched what we call our Stop Hate for Profit. This was focused on calling on Facebook to all, we call on actually on, um, on advertisers to stop advertising on Facebook and Instagram until they addressed hate on their platforms. We, this brought in some of the largest companies and brands from Coca-Cola to Disney to Unilever across the board 
who halted their advertising for multiple months on Facebook's platform, and ultimately how we push the company and others to do more as it relates to fighting hate online. There's a long way to go, and this campaign continues together today. The next part is access to justice. Government needs to close the gap in state and federal laws that deny victim, victims redress for serious digital abuse crimes, such as doxing or swatting and non-consensual distribution of intimate imagery. And we've seen this occur. You've seen these different things um, in the news and it is dangerous and people are getting hurt and their reputations are getting hurt. And ultimately our Backspace hate campaign mirrors the campaign that ADL launched back in the late 1980s, early 1990s to bring hate crimes laws to every state in the United States. This is similar to bring cyber hate um, protections here in all 50 states. And we will be launching this campaign in Illinois in the next couple months. Last, additionally, interrupting disinformation. We need government and social media platforms to use the same ingenuity that they've come up with with their algorithms to ultimately tamp down on misinformation, whether it be QAnon conspiracies, whether it be conspiracies about COVID and vaccinations, et cetera. That's really important. And lastly, we need to continue researching and innovating in different ways to track hate online. ADL is creating what we call our online hate index, which is referred to by YouTube and Reddit as the Nielsen ratings of online hate, where we're able to scrape social media platforms to actually quantify the level and the intensity of hate, um, of whether it be anti-Semitism, whether it be xenophobia, whether it be xenophobia, anti-Black racism, misogyny, and ultimately help platforms understand what is happening on their platform, because that is something that they've told us, we know we have a problem, but we need help quantifying it. So the ADL is stepping up to help them. And then lastly, thinking about how you can guard against algorithms and misinformation. Number one, this is a more personal thing that you can do. You have the option, you can actually go what's called incognito. You can go on your, in your search engines in the upper right-hand corner when you select um, that little star up there, whether you're using Chrome or Explorer or Firefox or whatever you're using, you can actually go incognito, which, which allows you to protect the cookies and, and, and advertisers and social media platforms cannot see all of your searches. You also can go online and look at how you can limit algorithm generated recommendations on different social media pages and platforms that you use because there are different security settings that you can use and change which ultimately protects your information. Now, the, this last piece too that I'll add here is a little cute, but when you think about when you share information, one of the things that we encourage people to do is actually think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? Do you really have to share this information? And then lastly, some words to live by that I'll leave you with from the great Abraham Lincoln. The problem with quotes found on the internet is that they are often not true. And then lastly, don't believe everything you read on the internet just because there's a picture with a quote next to it, again, from Abraham Lincoln. So obviously those are intended to be comical, um, but I did wanna sort of end on this lighter note. And with that, I'm gonna stop sharing the screen, appreciate the opportunity to to share this information, to give you a little bit of insight on how algorithms and artificial intelligence affect the information that you have access to and ultimately can drive this misinformation uh, and hateful messages that unfortunately continue to plague our society. David, that was an incredible presentation. It really was. And now it's time to talk. I had questions and so did the audience. Um, first of all, I was shocked that most of the misinformation is in the age group of people 65 and older. Do you know why? So AD, I want to preface this. AD, this was not ADL study, um, but the studies that are out there suggest that um, 
those of an older generation tend to be quicker to share this information without necessarily doing the searches. I see it, by the way, with my own parents and the information that they share, and they're more likely to trust the sources that they see. So if their friend posted it, then they, it must be reliable, and then they post it as well. Um, whereas younger folks, it's not that they're necessarily researching the information anymore, um, but they're, we find that they're not share, that they actually don't share as much. I'm just really surprised. I thought kids, and that's everybody younger than me, you know, would be much more active in sharing information, especially teenagers. So that that was very surprising to me. Um, but I want to know why you think that things have doubled in the last year or so. Why have has misinformation doubled and hate misinformation doubled? Yeah. So there were definitely instances, and I mean, I, I think. Let me back up. The election and the intensity around the election um, and whether you believe that there were outside forces that were shaping different things or trying to influence it, there was, there's no question about it though that the intensity around the election this past time around um, contributed significantly to the rhetoric, the misinformation that we saw online, the lies that were coming out of candidates the fear mongering that we saw and look ADL and NCJW are, I mean, we are, we are a 501c3, we're a nonpartisan organization, um, but we held politicians on either side of the aisle responsible for spreading misinformation, for spreading lies. And um, that was occurring on a regular basis. And we also know that there were groups and organizations that were organized with the absolute intention to spread misinformation and spread lies. And that occurred um, throughout that election, throughout the election. And um, I definitely think that that contributed an incredible amount to the spread to that doubling of misinformation. And, and frankly, also, um, all of these different groups and organizations and uh, websites popped up where you had no idea who was running this thing, right? In some cases, they took, um, they, they took responsibility for it and they put their name toward it. But too often, you know, Jan, you and I, it was like you and I having a blog in our basement and just writing our opinion as if it comes across as fact. And people then spread it and share it. And there was a lot of that, I think. And there's a lot of that that occurred that, that is out there today as well. So I've heard the statistic that lies sell four times faster than facts. Is, is that part of it? Do you feel that's a, that's a part of it, that people are just very love sensationalism is much more fun. Well, I think number one, I think there's that, but I also think that we live in a, in a world and a society that requires almost instant gratification. And by that, I mean, we get it. We, we don't read an actual newspaper, the full article. We read the little clip right here, right? How, how many studies have we seen about people who just read the headline and then they forward articles about that just has a headline that is total clickbait, but they never even read the article and then it gets, and they push it out, they forward it, they repost it, they share it. I suspect that almost everybody on this call, myself included, are just as guilty of that, right? And so you think about how news stories or complex issues all of a sudden have to be described in 140 characters or less on Twitter, right? Complex issues somehow can be boiled down to 140 characters. I mean, I think about it when I talk with the press where I, you know, they ask a tough question. I can't go into the answer as in depth as I'm going into it right now. I'll do a 15 minute interview with a TV reporter and they put five seconds of what I said on the TV, in the, in the article or in the story. And the other piece of it too that I would say, Jan, is that, um, when you do think about news, who we rely on reporters, right? There's no such thing as a beat reporter anymore who really dives into an issue and really understands the complexities of the issues. There's so few of those. Now you've got reporters because local news has shrunk down so much who have to churn out three, four, five stories in a day. They don't have time to investigate certain things. They don't have time to fact check certain information. They're like, oh, give me a credible source and they define what credible is and you can provide it to them and all of a sudden they run with it. And that's how misinformation spreads as well. 
Um, and so it, it becomes a problem. And you also have news sources that have political leanings and their intention is to tell a story through a particular lens. And so that becomes problematic too. And that leads me to, I've heard Facebook on Facebook, 98% of the misinformation comes from 12 sources. Is that accurate that there just are, a, you know, the nefarious sources on Facebook are just very good at spreading through. Yeah, I don't know if it's 12 or whatever it is, but it's a small universe um, that exists solely to spread this misinformation. They know the algorithms, they know how to work it, they know how to, um, they, they know human nature and they create headlines that are, you know, as I said, clickbaits and people click on them and they share them and they know how to take people down that rabbit hole. So Carol Levine asks, you can distinguish the difference between Facebook. Can you tell us how Facebook and Snapshot is different? Actually, I have no idea. But the reason she asks is because her understanding is Snapshot posts are only very short and she wonders if they have as much impact. So maybe address both of those parts. Absolutely. So just like, so you're, Carol, you're right. Snapchat is a very brief uh, video clip. If I remember correctly, it's like 12 or 15 seconds or something like that. Um, and it doesn't stay on forever. Um, however, what we found though, is that Snapchat, just like other social media platforms, they have their own algorithms. And while it doesn't necessarily stay on there in perpetuity, those who can view it, it does happen and things can go viral very, very quickly and that misinformation. And so um, it, the longevity or the, life, uh, the, the lifetime of, of a particular post or video might not be as long lived as Facebook. Uh, but the algorithm still can feed into the spread of misinformation in a similar way. That's very helpful. Somebody else asked, what form does this online harassment take? So it can take a lot of different forms. It can take uh, personal attacks against somebody's identity uh, or against the individual or their particular political persuasions or their own personal views. It can take the, um, it can come in the form of what's called um, swatting, which often occurs in online gaming. And swatting actually is uh, this idea that somebody is playing a video game, an online video game, through an online video game platform. They figure out where the person lives, who they're playing against, and they call to report some type of crime occurring or someone's being held hostage and the SWAT team shows up at their home and breaks into the home. And it often is, tar is often occurs, um, members of the black community and the Hispanic community are often targeted in this. Doxing is another form of online harassment. And that is, um, I can't say, false and misleading information about Jan because it could become libelous. However, I could call Jan's employer and say, did you know you employ a pedophile? Did you know that one of your employees' husbands or partners is this and this and that? And you create sort of a stir where you are attacking the individual, um, but without attacking them directly and while also not violating your First Amendment rights um, under current law. So that is another thing that occurs. And often people's information is publicly listed. There was a big story in the last year of roughly, I think, four or five dozen Jewish women who were targeted and their personal information was listed online. And ultimately, people who were responsible, some people who were responsible for it were, um, were ultimately um, uh, arrested for it. But this type of online harassment occurs when we, I had a colleague of mine who is indigenous and a member of an American Indian tribe out of uh, now what is called Minnesota, um, who is a very, not Jewish, very strong supporter of Israel. Uh, some of you may have seen that earlier today that a particular group 
had said that they will not participate in a voter rights rally because the RAC, the Reform Action Committee, or the Reform Movement, um, JCPA, the Jewish Council for Public Affairs, and one other Jewish group was participating in this rally. And my colleague um, was very vocal against that group for uh, targeting Jewish groups because of their support of Israel. And he was attacked significantly by people online and Twitter. So this occurs on a very regular basis, unfortunately, usually targeting people because of their identity. Um, I lost the screen. Do you see me? I am... I can see I can see you, Jan. You're good. Okay, so I lost the questions because I don't know what happened here, and I'm not technologically smart. I, but one of I, the can, I can see is... I can see them, by the way. Oh, you can. So one of the questions was that technology says it's not their fault that there's hate, and yet she worries that through regulation the hate will be blocked, and then we won't know the hate that's there. So a how is this best done so that we know the hate is there and we can address it? It's a really good question. So um, it is often the feeling of, for example, when you get when you get someone like a David Duke kicked off of Facebook or you get an extremist group kicked off of a mainstream social media platform, then they're going to turn to a, the dark web or and we're no longer gonna be able to track and monitor them. What we have seen and has been our experience is that when you take this information down, it has a correlation on the number of events or the ability for individuals to amplify and spread their hateful messages. And, um, and I, I, I say this not with the intention of being political, but think about the impact when President Trump was was banned from Facebook or banned from uh, Twitter and the spread of the hateful um, gaslighting that he was doing, um, we saw a significant decline. When certain groups and organizations have been removed from these mainstream platforms, we've seen them, they have to work harder and it's, it's much more difficult for them to recruit and to spread their hateful messages. And, um, there are groups like us who can still monitor and track them for what they're doing, uh, but, it's, but it is their ability to, shall we say, normalize hate through these mainstream platforms that we have to take away from them. That, that's very helpful. I can't see the other questions that are in the block. I think Merle Gross had a question. Can yeah, you and, and Merle, Merle asked um, uh, a, Merle asked a couple of things here, um, is that does it all boil down to how to separate fact from fiction and biblical text is often quoted and believed as fact, but isn't most of it simply a reflection of and platform for opinion of earlier times. So I won't comment on the biblical text. I would, I'll leave that to the rabbis in the world, but I, I, I think it's a combination of number one, how do you separate fact from fiction? So if you think back to um, that graphic that I showed the second to last slide, the idea of if it doesn't seem right, or how do you check your sources? And is it a credible news source? Or is it just from some random page? Or when someone says, oh, I heard this, or these people said this, well, who are these people? And where did they say it? And how did they say it? And why did they say it? It's being critical of the information that you take in and that you use to shape your opinion. So that's one element of it. The second part though, as I shared here, is that algorithmic bias, and algorithmic amplification that I talked about today are very real. Those fuel business models of these multi, 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 multi-billion dollar corporations who make money off of your clicks. And in many ways, by stifling this misinformation that by the way, is being fueled by ad dollars and advertisements, it's actually in some ways counterproductive or counter to their business model to crack down on this. And it's sort of this idea that when Mark Zuckerberg was hauled in front of Congress a year ago, he was, he kind of, he implied or used the analogy of like Facebook is just a conduit through which people are sharing information. And he said, you know, I, I don't remember exactly the quote, but he, I don't remember if he said directly or he implied it, but it was something along the lines of, well, if somebody called 
and threaten somebody else you in in you know 30 40 years ago you wouldn't sue the phone company for being the mechanism through which they they spread that threat so why are you coming after facebook and that would be true if facebook if if the phone companies had an algorithm that fed this misinformation and the reality is that these companies make money off of this and they can they we have to address it so it's yes there is a personal responsibility of fact from fiction 100% and at the same time too is that as i said earlier the same ingenuity that companies use to create these algorithms and to share this information and change the way we communicate and interact with one another also has to be used to stop the spread of hate and misinformation that that is just so helpful um, one person asked, do you have an outline of how people can analyze information and decide whether to share it or not? Absolutely. So I put up that one and I'll, and I'll, I'll quickly throw it back up um, to everybody that I'll, I'll kind of go through it because I think it kind of hits on the last question, but I'll, I'll pop it up there. Um, is this idea of thinking, is it true? So number one, there's an element of common sense there, right? This just doesn't feel right. Then from there, I would tell you, search, where is this information coming from? Click on it. Is it a credible news source or is it just some random website that somebody posted? And if it's a random website, think twice about it. The next is, is it helpful? Is there a reason why you're posting? Is it helpful that you're sharing this information? Does it inspire? Is it necessary? Is it kind? And so these are some things about what you know, guidelines that you could use before you post different things. So for me, the idea of how you analyze information, I think first that common sense piece, and second then figuring out where does that information coming from? What's the source of it? Can you fact check it too? Can you see it in other places? Can you go to a, a Washington Post or a New York Times or a Wall Street Journal or something that's more credible that's more credible than you know jan and david's blog the next question is very interesting these questions are good do you think that if online harassment was not anonymous it would be less if people were accountable that they were the ones providing it 100 percent, absolutely i think that people hide behind the anonymity no doubt, no question about it, right? If you think about some of the attacks that you read on Twitter or you read on Facebook or some of the things, imagine walking up to somebody and saying it to their face. Imagine, would you have the guts to do that? And then imagine what the reaction would be, right? And so that's an important um, uh, thing to keep in mind. I, I, it's a great question, it's a great point. And um, I, I think that people would not be quite as bold if they actually had to put their name to something. The next question is very interesting as well. What happens when a credible news source like the New York Times or the BBC or the Guardian publish very anti-Israeli news? You got to call it out. You have to call it out, right? And you have to respond with facts and with information. Um, unfortunately, we've seen different news publications that have certain biases um, and the way that they report certain things. Uh, and you have to call it out. You have to call it out loudly and you have to call it out and respond with facts and information. And it underlines that it's not just that credible sources can give us misinformation and bias as well and that we should yeah. lose track of that. And you have to hold them accountable and demand, you know, uh, retractions or demand and, and, and while it doesn't always, it doesn't always um, remedy the situation, a retraction or uh, uh, um, a correction of information, the hope though is that you fix it so that it doesn't occur again. So we're gonna do two more questions and they really segue into what we're gonna be talking about next Monday. One is to stop misinformation, is it the responsibility of the media or Congress regulating it? And the other one is, what is the significance of the information that's been brought forward by the Facebook whistleblower? Will it change anything? I don't know if you want to touch on that to sort of give yeah. us a little taste before next week. So um, 
Elena's question to stop misinformation, is it the responsibility of the media or Congress regulating it? The answer is yes, yes, and yes. And the third yes is it's really gonna take, frankly, a whole of society approach. There's an element if you remember the different parts of the repair plan that I shared with everyone, and I know I went through it quickly, there's roles for civil society, there's roles for government, there's roles for the social media platforms, there's roles for all of us, there's roles for, um, uh, uh, um, there's roles for the media to play in calling it out. And I think that it's absolutely critical that we do take this whole of society approach towards solving and addressing this problem because there really is no, and I hate it's so cliche-ish, but there really is no silver bullet to solving this problem, right? You can fix the algorithm, but if people are still sharing misinformation, sure, it might be less easy to run to find it. However, it's still out there. And, and so, um, and if a social media platform says that they don't have any account, they can't be held accountable for it because they don't have any responsibility. Well, that's a problem too. And so there's different roles for everyone to play in there. And then the last piece about this question about the, the Facebook whistleblower, will it change anything? I, I don't know. And I say that in a sad way. I don't know. Um, I do believe, and ADL led this coalition, the Stop Hate for Profit Coalition, I do believe that we brought on a level of pressure on Facebook and a microscope on Facebook. And we've been leading this charge I really, and I don't say this just because I work for ADL, there really is nobody out there who has been this aggressive in going after Facebook. Um, and um, we will continue and we are unrelenting in this. And so I think over time, it will hopefully continue to apply pressure and expose uh, the hypocrisy and expose what they actually know and what they're contributing to, excuse me, contributing to. And so I think we have to keep the pressure up. I think the whistleblower is an important step because it's not just about, you know, we're, we're not just getting into questions here about misinformation. We're now starting to deal with issues of, uh, of how young girls view themselves. And we look at Instagram and the impact that it's having on the psychology of young girls. And it, it brings almost another layer of the damage that this is doing on society. And, um, and so I think that that's going to be really important too, because as you continue to peel off the onion layers, you're going to see what the company is actually capable or what a platform is capable of doing to do the right thing. And we have to keep up this whole of society approach to compel them to do so. Thank you so much, David. I feel so grateful that you are the, the leadership of the ADL. We are so, besides tonight, which was absolutely fantastic. I mean, you, you led us through it, a very complex discussion in a very easy way to understand. And it was so enlightening. And so, I learned so much. I think everybody did. But you also, I can, what I hear so deeply, which I, I think everybody is aware of, how much your leadership matters to us that you're there and that your staff is there looking out for all of us to lead us in a just way that's fair for everybody. And I can't thank you enough. Oh, Jan, I appreciate the opportunity. And if folks want to learn more or access these different studies that I talked about or more information about the repair plan, you can go to ADL.org. Uh, pretty straightforward. But all of these different studies through our Center for Technology and Society, and other things about the work that we do in fighting hate online, it's all up there and it's free. Uh, so feel free to visit at any point. Thank you so much. I'd like to thank everybody who came tonight. And I'd also like to thank our committee, Beth Nashberg, Sharon Johnson, Donna Fishman, Kim Sterling, Carol Levine, Magna Roth, Elena Marone, Merle Gross, Deb Pepworth, Ellen Kaplan, Sylvia Myers, Chuck Myers, Harriet Choice, Jill Wolf, and Deborah Barotkin. Without these amazing people, this program would not have gotten off the ground. We have all worked hard for, for close to a year to make this happen. And it's so exciting that it is. And it's so timely with everything that's going on. I want everyone to note the evaluation link in the chat. Uh, we, you can fill that out tonight. That'd be great. 
Otherwise, uh, you will be receiving an email in the next couple of days with a summary of tonight's program and an, the evaluation link will be there as well. We hope you fill it out because we depend on your feedback to guide us. Our last program of the series will be Monday, October 25th at seven o'clock, Let's Talk, My Rights, Your Rights. And our featured speakers are an incredible lineup like David of experts, Ian Rosenberg, Jacqueline Carroll, and Brett Schaefer. I hope to see you all there. I think that after tonight, we're very excited to know what we can do. And I just wanna wish everyone a good night. Thank you for coming. Thank you.